Oh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you all for coming. Basically, um, what I'm going to talk about is pyrotechnic effects for models, uh, which are, by definition, small. So whatever I demonstrate today will certainly be well within your 100 gram limit, because we're talking about half teaspoon, teaspoon quantities, um, which if you look at it in black powder is something of the order of five grams or so. Um, the couple of things we did recently, uh, we did the Thunderbirds title remake. Um, ITV are supposed to be resurrecting Thunderbirds sometime next year. So there's been a lot of interest in it. There's, go there's been a big seminar and uh, uh, that's coming up in the next couple of months or so. And uh, obviously a lot of the people who did Thunderbirds originally are no longer with us. They are up with the great firework god in the sky. Um, so I was involved when I was associated with Brox um, in supplying a number of fountains for the Thunderbird models, some of which were specially made. Um, so I used to have a lot of uh, uh, goings on with Derek Meddings and things. Um, although, as I said to the producer, I had no idea what they did with them after they left Brox or after they left us. Um, so we had to, to a certain extent, uh, go back to first principles and start from scratch. And the last bit is uh, one we did for a recent film that's coming out, uh, uh, that uh, is out now, um, called The Monuments Men. Okay, so um, obviously we start with the metals and we have all the usual suspects and we've got iron, magnesium, aluminium, uh, titanium and to a lesser, lesser extent zinc. And uh, iron, uh, you will get sparks at the yellow end of the spectrum magnesium at the bright white end and titanium in between. Um, I haven't actually used magnalium much, um, more historically because uh, in the past when we, when we had our own small firework factory, um, magnalium wasn't that readily available. But obviously you can use magnalium, although I haven't uh, used it as such. And uh, in terms of spark production, Aluminium and magnesium themselves produce very, very little branching, so it's a solid spark. Titanium produces a bit more, and if you want lots of branch sparks, obviously you use iron. Carbon um, will give you yellow-orange, and the duration of the carbon spark is very, very much dependent on the amount of sulphur that you have in the mix. The more sulphur you have, the more branching and the more duration that you get of the sparks and obviously you can uh, alter the carbon sizes, the charcoal sizes. Again you can get such a such a wide range of, of sparks from a very very small duration to a very very long duration and that's quite important when you're working with models as you'll see in a moment. Um, sorry I've pressed the wrong one. Uh, glitter mixes are also quite useful, um, and again, you can experiment there. You can have a glitter mix that contains something like around 80% meal gum powder um, and, and less sulphur, and then you can drop the gum powder mix down to about 40%, put more sulphur in, and again, you'll get different durations of sparks. Uh, the glitter mix mixes obviously contain sodium oxalate and uh, antimony sulphide as well. Uh, then you have the gum powders, and it's surprising how much of an effect you can get simply by mixing gum powders with metals, as I'll demonstrate to you later on outside. Um, and again, the spark duration is very, very closely related to the particle size. Um, we sieve a lot, so um, our ranges of titanium, for instance, will be between 12 and 24 mesh, uh, 24 to 36 mesh, and 36 to 60 mesh, and all of which will give distinctly different effects. I've got some actual samples of those for people to look at afterwards um, just to see what we're doing. The gunpowder themselves, obviously you've got meal A, which is very, very fine gunpowder, meal XF, which is a mixture of gunpowder and uh, uh, small grains. Um, think of it as the meal cake um, crushed up. And then you've got the processed gum powders, the grain gum powders, 4FA and 5FA are the ones you're more familiar with. Um, we also have access to things like TP Cannon. 
and uh, for very, very closely controlled effects, um, you can use the defense grades, although they're becoming increasingly difficult to obtain. For instance, G12 uh, gunpowder has grains between 8 and 16 mesh. I apologize for all these meshes being in chess, but uh, um, you can see from my age that I haven't really converted to microns. Uh, G20 is 15 to 25, and G40 is 25 to 52, and uh, uh, these are equivalent roughly, if you like, to uh, a cannon grade, a rifle grade, and a pistol grade for those of you who are involved in muzzle-loading guns. And as I said, the quantities are, uh, are small because one teaspoon of 4FA gunpowder is around five grams. Uh, flash powders, yes, we use those. All the usual suspects, um, uh, potassium perchlorate, dark pyroaluminium, Potassium chlorate and bright aluminium um, is in fact a lot easier to light. Um, you have to be a bit careful with the dark pyro, uh, igniting it directly from, igni from an electric igniter. Generally you have to add a little bit of uh, raw black match in uh, adjacent to the igniter, whereas the chlorate and the bright aluminium is much, much easier to light and uh, also gives you a longer duration flash. So again, you can alter the flash duration and uh, things like that, which I'll come on to that in, that in a minute, where um, sometimes if you need a very, very short flash, you'll use magnesium and potassium perchlorate. Uh, colours we haven't used very much. Um, if we do, it'll be ammonium perchlorate low smoke mix. Um, but also, it's quite common to colour a Jeep gunpowder effect using such as powder paint. Smoke um, is used to use a lot in the past of naphthalene with gunpowder or anthracene, but uh, these have now all been classified as carcinogenic. So for studio work now, we generally achieve a similar sort of effect with inerts. So grey powder, black powder um, exploded with a gunpowder mix. And as I said, inert materials, you have plaster dust and pieces, Rubber pieces are quite useful um, because uh, when, when you blow them up, uh, if you like, on a small effect, they will carry not too far away because in a model you don't want the debris to be too far away from the explosion, otherwise it will be out of scale. And also, not forgetting compressed air blowing, uh, which again is, uh, I'll come on to in a minute. So that's the inert materials. Um, now, firing was originally mechanically in the early days of Thunderbird, which was all done uh, in my neck of the woods on slow trading estate. Um, it was uh, done with cams and micro switches, and they used to adjust the motor speeds, the position of the cams to get the um, timings in the right place. And uh, if, you were, if you think about it, they were getting down to fractions of a second. Now with the electronics, it's trivially easy to get a hundred of the second intervals without any problem. And finally, on all this, record keeping is absolutely vital. Whatever you do on this, um, uh, we have on the one hand the model makers who want you to use the minimum amount, and on the other hand, we have the visual effects designers who say, we want more, we want more. Um, so there's a lot of pre-experimentation goes on with high-speed photography, to determine whether the effect is in the right ballpark. So you do have to keep records of exactly what materials you've used and what quantity you use, and you have to be firm with the producers if, if there's experiments. Uh, no, stop, I have to record this before we carry on, because otherwise the following day they'll say, right, we want to do effect one, and you haven't any idea what effect one is if you haven't kept a record of it. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the original Thunderbirds uh, mechanically cam-operated micro-switches, um, which you can see up there. There's a barrage of micro-switches there, all of which would be connected to the various effects via plug-ins and things like that. Quite difficult to adjust, um, and it used to take a lot of time and a lot of experimentation to get everything in the right place. So this is the original Thunderbirds title. Uh, 
obviously that was sh uh, uh, they are shot at high speed and typically 120 frames per second. Um, so if you want something uh, to be a second apart on, on the film, you've got to convert it back to 24 frames a second. So you've then got to divide the time by five. And invariably the sounds are added afterwards. So they're not interested in what sound your effect makes at all. Uh, so this is the one that we did for in July last year for Thunderbirds. You can see here. That, oh, sorry. Um, you can see here that the camera is set to 125 feet per second. So that uh, is the rig, and uh, there's myself and one of the rig builders there, made up of plastic parts and whatever have you. and uh, another shot of it here and you can see the various effects there various woks containing uh, materials you can see that wok there has got rubber pieces in um, there's a there's a small mortar there which contains uh, um, uh, bags of a small bag with a small charge of gunpowder you can just see the electric igniter wire and that uh, was the final flourish you, you'll see the effect of it in the moment in a moment and uh, the, the various parts of the set are coated with inflammable material, which you will see will catch. And uh, that's a still of one of the effects. So you can see it's in scale. You can see the sparks there. That will be a mixture of uh, a glitter mix and gunpowder. And that's the mortar being fired with... Uh, uh, that was topped up with liquid petrol and... Uh, inert pieces. Uh, that's a still of one of the other effects. Uh, that, that is the open wok um, with again a, a small parcel of a, a couple of teaspoonfuls of uh, grain gunpowder uh, wrapped in uh, tape and covered with debris and uh, pieces of charcoal and That's a group photo of all the guys who were involved in building it. Uh, you see my colleague David hiding there at the back. And uh, so I've now got some here in real time with slowed and the sound effects added. So this is one of the original Thunderbirds guys. You can see here, this is a shop which uses a combination of plastic kits to look like an oil refinery and we would have buried in amongst all this stuff little explosive charges and slightly bigger explosive charges and even bigger explosive charges to make the whole refinery blow up which would be done with a series of hits one after the other camera running at high speed and focus from as close to the camera lens as we could get to the backing to make it all look like reality so if you're ready boys we can blow it up You'll notice it's film camera. I'll, I'll come to that in, in... To give you an idea of the scale, those lights there are Christmas tree lights. So that's what it looked like in real time. Right, the system is on. Okay. Okay, I'm just about to this is it taken with a different camera at the side, so you won't see the whole thing on this one. And this is how it will appear, in, uh, again, this is an initial edit, but this is what it looks like at 120 frames per second. And then this is an, again, initial edit of how it will appear in the final recreation. You 
see the pieces of rubber flying about everywhere. And the sound coming in is Thunderbird 2, or Thunderbird 1 gradually coming in. So I don't know when this will be out, um, but sometime this year. So you'll be able to buy it all on DVD. Uh, and uh, Monuments Men, which is, and I don't know whether any of you have seen it, it's a recent film with George Clooney, Matt Damon. And uh, I'll probably have to go back with that because that's a bit rapid. So that is part of a church. Um, it, it was a war film and that's part of a church and that there at the bottom here is a compressed air cannon with inert materials and a, a flash pot in the middle of it. So if I go back and watch closely. So that's a test uh, done out just outside the studios. And to give you some idea of the scale, that's one of the chaps there who build these models. Very, very talented people who build these models, by the way. And uh, this is where it will actually be in the film or where it was supposed to be in the film because they decided that this particular section was a bit too warlike and they cut it out from the film that was actually in the cinema despite spending umpteen tens of thousands of pounds and very many days of filming but it will be it will be on the editor's cut when if anybody buys the DVD um, so again, th that's the mock-up there. Um, if I just, that tank there and that tank there, they're full size and those were firing blanks. So this is all full size. Those are models, which you wouldn't think of. You can see a blue screen there and you can just see the steeple of the church there and this is the bottom part of the steeple. So if I go back on that... So you can see the flash and the bang and the compressed air. So you can see that's quite realistic. Now, the tank I showed you in the bottom foreground, the visual effects designer decided that there just wasn't enough dust and debris. So they spent considerable numbers of hours just setting up this rig. And uh, again, you can see the cameras here. And uh, you notice that it's got a film cassette, which I queried. I said, these are all very, very comp uh, complex digital cameras, very high speed. And they have the advantage that they can uh, store the live action in the film with the live actors at full size. They can put the effect on. So that tank there, they mocked up um, very quickly with a... F the, the turret was um, movable and with height and azimuth and rotation to be exactly the same as the one in the film and obviously the distances between the cameras to get the perspective right and you can see up there where they've superimposed that and so as I say what they're trying to do is to enhance the effect of this tank here and they're, they're trying to uh, create more dust So you can see the amount of work that goes into just a very, very, very small um, time of film. And the next one is pictures of setup. And here, this is the outdoor setup of the uh, church steeple. And you've got two digital cameras here. There's all the electronic processing. Oh, yes, uh, mentioning the reason for film. Apparently, uh, all the major films, they still do it on film because they are concerned about the longevity of the archive. They know that film stored properly will keep for 100 years. They don't know about magnetic media. But the cameras are all fully digitised. So that's the actual steeple up on its uh, uh, height. And you can, see the, you can see the degree of workmanship in all this. And there's my colleague David up there uh, putting some extra dust on or adjusting one of the effects. And that's uh, just after the effect with the steeple um, being tilted and falling onto the ground. You can see the blue screen as to where it would go in the part of the film where the tanks were. And again, uh, the visual effects 
director said, no, there's not enough debris there, so they had people up there uh, pouring debris down um, after repairing all this because that all got damaged when the steeple fell on it. And uh, so that will again be added into the main film. And this gives you some idea of the details in the, mo in the uh, models. You can see the absolute wonderful work that these guys do in making this. And uh, the windows. Uh, th this, this was all in the actual film, by the way. And uh, again, the um, extreme detail. I mean, look at that on the shutters. You know, you get to really appreciate this when you're working with the with this because uh, you you would only see that for you know maybe a few seconds in the film. And again, debris and uh, looking from the inside of a ruined building. And uh, I rather like these damaged chairs and damaged tables. More debris and a ruined roof there. And to give you some idea of the scale, that's uh, the models on their tables. They can rotate them and tilt them to get various aspects. And there's the visual effects designer um, inspecting them just to give you some idea of the actual scale of uh, the things you're working with uh, when you're trying to do miniature special effects. And that's it. If there's any questions, I'd uh, be pleased to answer them. Thank you.